So you're sitting there, absolutely gone from here on a pinnacle of energy and everything down there to the bottom of depths of despair in one phone call. One phone call, that's all it took. And then you went, what the hell am I gonna do? So I did what Gula taught me to do. <clears throat> I sat up in, my, in bed, on top of my bed, like like it's like a monk cost like and i started to direct my energy from me to him where he was in the hospital with ruth in bed they were he was she was just lying with him in bed keeping him company right that's what i did and i hadn't done it before but i knew it could be done because he's he's done it and i've seen it work so that's what i did something happened I don't know what happened, but all I know is I w was awake around, it's got to be six in the morning, sitting in the same position, not remembering anything. But I felt the sense of something coming back into my body, like something was returning. And I thought, I think things are going to be okay. I got in my car, I drove to Perth, picked up the kids, drove up to Ottawa, went into the hospital room, and uh, Ruth was there laying on the bed with him. You could see the organs pushing out of his body. It was neuroblastoma, it was systemic, it was all through the body. And he hadn't said a word for four days, nothing. And Michelle, my daughter, walked in the door, and he suddenly sat up, and he said, hi, Michelle. Ruth sat up, she couldn't believe it. The nurses rushed in, they didn't know what was going on. The doctors came in, they, they rushed him off, came back way later. Friggin' cancer had gone into remission at a stage four. Five is dead. Stage four, gone into remission, stopped, expanding. And I'm like, oh, geez. Now what? So that set off a whole chain of events that eventually led to him dying. Because you get into this incredible conflict with the medical system. I can't tell anybody what I did. And she, Ruth, she could do the same thing. She was just as adept at this as I was. And she was there with him doing, doing this. Healing him, trying to heal him, trying to give him that energy in order to combat this. So you can't tell the doctors. You can tell each other, but you can't tell the doctors. And as soon as they found a stage four neuroblastoma who lived, they've got an experiment. They've got something they've never had before at Sick Children's in Ottawa. And that's what they wanted. They wanted him to be tested the way they would test any other kid chemotherapy, radiation. So that set up this conflict about what to do, right? So eventually, long term, they won out. And 18 months later, he died. And in the process of going through that 18 months, everything in my life just disappeared, collapsed. Everything, lost everything. So did she, my wife. It was the worst possible time you could possibly imagine. And, and then you, you have to kind of regroup somehow, right? So two, three things happen. One was the guys I play hockey with in Perth, most of whom I grew up with, said, you're back here every Sunday morning and you're playing hockey from Toronto. That's, what, that's one thing. Second thing was a letter from the Aborigines saying how much they missed him and loved him. And would I come back and run the land council? And the third thing was a letter from Barry Coulter, the Minister of Community Government, or 
uh, community development, asking if I come back and run local government for an Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory as an administrator. Those are the three things that happen. To do the, t the last two, I would have had to go to Australia on my own and leave my kids behind. But I couldn't do that. So I, I, did. So I stayed, eh? That's what happened. So I stayed and just tried to get things back together, right? And that's why Perth's important. I got ties here that a lifetime. As one of the guys said, we don't really socialize with each other very much, like the guys who play hockey and baseball together. But I said, if you pick up the phone and phone any one of the guys in this room in trouble, they'll be on your doorstep in five minutes. That's what it is. Where do you get that these days? You don't get it in Toronto. I imagine you have, in Quebec, I, guess, I just think you probably have more places like that and more relationships like that than most places, I would think. I may be wrong, but... Yeah, so... And then you're going to try and, you know, try and get... So I kept teaching. That wasn't, that wasn't easy. But then I started to see things that I'd never seen before. I started to see the illumination around objects like Murabuddha had told me that he sees, a kind of smokiness around things that indicates there's another dimension to reality than the material one that they call Amavurnala with Dora, and that that is the fundamental basis of their society. I, used to, I started to see these things. They weren't just ideas, you know. And I started to see, I saw my son three times after he died. I saw him. It, it did not look like a, a person, but I knew it was him. I saw him. And eventually went back to Australia. I started to see the things they saw in the bush and some experiences that were just amazing. So I wrote, the, I wrote it up, a lot of it up. In, uh, which I think is my best work was um, Return to Eden, a book I wrote, which recounts 1986, that year, but with the added advantage of having gained that vision. Like, so you're kind of looking at things. Some of it I gained while I was there, but most of it was afterwards. And like, it's, they see this all the time. They have these experiences that are just normal. And for us, they're kind of religious experiences or spiritual experiences. But, not, but not, that's not what it's like. And um, I could see them within a certain space of my life where I was distracted by pain, right, and suffering. But once things started to normalize, I lost that, I lost it, that ability. The only place I ever got it back was a brief time in a Zen monastery in Japan. Very brief. By meditating, right? I could get it back. And I used to do that here too. But I haven't done it much lately. I don't know why, but... So you go into another way of life and you... You treat it as an object of study, I guess, initially, and you're trying to find out things and how it works and stuff. And then you go in a little deeper and get a deeper insight from, from them about it, but it's not really all there is. If you don't get to actually see it yourself, what they're telling you they see or experience, you're not in it. You're not really in it. So there was a, when I went back to translate the songs of Gula, there was a, a line in one of the songs that was translated, I translated it as the waves are laughing. I, well, how do waves laugh? So I didn't know what that meant. So I asked uh, Morabuddha, one of my friends there, so what, what does it mean the waves laugh? And he said, well, I can't explain it, but if you go down to the ocean, when the wind is blowing from the east and the tide's in, you'll see waves laugh. 
So I got into the four-wheel drive and I went down to the, the beach on a point on Bickerton Island looking over the group. And I came up over the sand dunes, went down, and looked out on the ocean. And I just started to chuckle. The freaking waves were laughing. And it was the most amazing thing. Every wave had exactly the same form. There were a billion of them. And they had exactly the same form, like this. Dum, 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 dum. It rose. And a wisp of white cap was blowing off the top of each one. It was the most amazing thing. That's how they learn. They don't learn by reading something in a book and studying it and say, oh yeah, I understand that now. They learn by going out there and they see it and they record it in their songs. The songs are about these kinds of things, right? And there's so many of them you couldn't keep up, but this was one important one. Other ones later on, you know, happened here, not necessarily in Australia. So, uh, and after a while, it, it kind of gets gets a bit scary because I don't know if you can live in this kind of zone all the time here. The whole thing about renunciation, about giving up all of something you have to somebody who needs it. The whole point of that is to maintain your spiritual purity. It's not that you're just giving it up. You're like nothing, empty, in a spiritual sense. In other words, part of you is in another dimension. So we're always attached over there to some extent. We're not cut off, we're, we're like this, part of us is extended over there. To keep that pure, you have to keep giving up all the material things in your that come into your, so you keep d discarding, right? So in a way, it's kind of maintaining spiritual purity as well as just an economic transaction. So it's not just gift giving and reciprocity. It's not, it's different. It has a different foundation for them than we think of it as economic. It has a spiritual foundation, which they can see. They can see Amawarana Alawatawara around a person's body. They can see the evidence that there's something going somewhere else from your body, from you, that's not material. I can see it. And Mora Buddha used to sit here and look at a tree outside the window when I was in the council office. We'd be just sitting there and he would describe this thing, this shadow around every leaf on the friggin' tree. Every leaf has the same thing. Not the whole tree, but the leaf and the tree. and it, Everything that's in the material world has this aspect to it, the spiritual thing that connects it somewhere else, right? So when people die, that part of them goes away, okay? It takes off. And you help it there by singing them across. Trouble is, as they've gone through their life, they've left bits and pieces of the spiritual part of yourself wherever they go. You just, you leave bits, like right now in this room, this is what's happening. You and I and the three or four of us. There's a bit of me and you and there's a bit of you and me and same with you and you. We're all kind of giving a little bit of our essence to each other. We don't even know it, but we are. And they're, they build a whole thing on this, a whole theology on this. So when you die, it's not enough just to sing the main body of that spiritual essence away. You have to travel around to every place that person's been, sing, and pick it all up and send it over with them. So traditionally, they would actually travel to the places where that, mostly their own country, right? Each country is a piece of land with resources, right? So they would travel around and sing in that place, clean it up, and send it over. So move to another. Well, you can't do that now because some have been to Melbourne or they've been to Sydney or. So they do it in one place and they s sing them, their own spirit there to pick it up. And that's how they can be in two places at the same time. Now the old people used to be able to do that. Not anymore. Gola told me there was only two people left after him who would be able to do that. And one was his daughter and another guy is now basically an alcoholic living in Darwin. Only two left out of that whole culture. Only two who could do it, who could s transport themselves somewhere else while they were here, too. That's where it's all gone, right? So how do you regroup in their culture, right? Very difficult. So we come down to 
2000, I got in touch with Ruth. She's my wife, ex first wife. She's living up in BC. We decided to donate all our Aboriginal art to the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory. That was the last thing we did. So we packed it all up and sent it off because m mostly I thought I'd been given the, for safekeeping, not for myself to sell or anything. So um, bark painting, spears, everything. I kept my didgeridoos because I played didgeridoo, so stuff like that. But personal stuff like that um, shell behind you there. That's the last, uh, that was painted by Aboriginal name Gugenda Durilli. And that's another story, a sad story here. And I kept that because it's very personal. He gave it to me before he died. Stuff like that. But most of it's there in the, in the museum, right? And the deal was that if we donate it to the museum and art gallery, then they have to keep at least two pieces on permanent display. And there's a plaque there in the name of my son who died, Ian, eh? who died. I haven't been back to check it all out again, but I suppose I will sometime. So, and then 2001, I got a call from the CBC if I'd take Suzuki over, which I did. <laughs> and we don't want to go there. <laughs> it, it just did not work out. Because I admire his work and what he does and everything, so it wouldn't be right to say too much. But it, it's kind of a matter of not knowing really where you are and what you have to do to survive there. There are a lot of snakes in Australia. <laughs> and my clan is called the Lara. And the Lara means dangerous snakes. And we got them all. We got King Browns, Death Adders, Tiger Snakes. And guess why we have those as our dreaming? Because in our country, on, ba on the mainland, where my clan originally came from in the 1920s probably, that's where the most abundance of these snakes happened to be. And that's where we went to take Suzuki. <laughs> it was not a good thing to be doing. And that's the other thing, what I found, like uh, this whole renunciative thing. Bickerton Island was pristine. Like no, They didn't allow Europeans there. Whereas Groot Island was the mining and everything. So I got to really study it really intensively, all the resources and all of the, the boundaries between the clans. And I found this most extraordinary thing, which could have been the, the case all across Australia, because it makes sense in terms of renunciation. That each clan, these clans are, are territorial bounded groups, okay? Uh, the boundaries are spiritual. They're set down by these dreamtime beings in the beginning of time. But they're not inviolable. You, they can be changed and modified, but never unified, always separated. If you have a dispute between two groups about where the boundaries are between two groups, they subdivide and federate. They don't emerge the two together and unite. Right? They never unite. It's, it's not a uniting culture. It's separate, federate, separate. And the federation part is the renunciative part. So what I found is that each clan had an abundance of a certain resource. And there are five clans. Each clan had one resource that, so obviously it wasn't natural. Whatever those boundaries have been drawn, they've been drawn specifically to make it so that you only had one resource. So the Wotamarba people had the wild yams, the, big, the best patch of wild yams going, right? And guess what their dreaming was? Wild yams. And guess what that meant? You can't consume it. Another one had Yinamamua, which is wild apples, which is a great delicacy and a fruit that's essential to the diet. My clan had, uh, well, the Warringal Yangba clan had that, which is affiliated with mine. Guess what they're dreaming is? Well, I'll be darned. It's wild apples, Yinamamua. Another clan had the best parrot fishing grounds. Parrot fish are the most easily taken abundant fish in the area off a shoal. Guess what they're dreaming was? Parrot fish. And the other one had fresh water. It had the only supply of year-round fresh water on the island because it was filled with rock soats from the rain. There was no natural rivers or streams. And I figured this one's tricky because how can you, if you're dreaming is water, I'll go and walk. How can you not have water? And they, they kind of 
fudged it by having you can't eat anything connected with fresh water, like fresh water fish, frogs, all kinds of things, of uh, plants that are connected with fresh water. So in each case, you had something that was specific to you, but you couldn't consume it. You had to give, you had to give it up to those other guys. And they had to give theirs up to these other guys. And, they had, and that's just like blows your mind to live like that. And Groot Island, you couldn't, mining had so destroyed the environment on the you know, western side of the island, you couldn't research it. And everything I was reading in the anthropological literature was typical, you know, resource ma management, and there was nothing about this at all, except in the travel reports of a couple of people, Donald Thompson, who was in the 1920s up in Arnhem Land, and another fellow who actually was on Groot Island, adventurer, they mentioned something like this, just in passing. So I'm thinking, have we really missed something that could have been right across the whole continent? So one of my students, Philippe Rouge, undergraduate student of mine, he was from Bermuda, and uh, he went to the University of Durham for a PhD, and I suggested he go and st study it with the Bardi people in West Australia. And they've been in contact for a long time. So we went out to study fishing resources and the harvesting of fishing resources among the Bardi. And guess what? The same logic was with the Bardi. In other words, if you go out and you spear a fish and you bring it ashore, you have to give it up to those who don't have fish. Starting with people who have less than nothing, which is the old people and the children, right? Then you don't have anything. So you go out. Somebody comes in, and they give you their catch. And that's the way it works, right? It actually works like that. And I mean, if you're on your own and you're in the bush, of course, you have to eat something. But basically, it works. And he found the same logic was amongst party fishermen. And, uh, and yet, in the literature, nothing. It's all exchange and reciprocity and gift. And that comes back to that thing at the beginning I did on the movie, right? Do we really know what we're looking at? Unless we're in the moment with it? No, we don't. You have to be in the moment with whatever it is you're claiming to perceive, which is what Gula is, t is teaching. If you're not in the moment with it, how do you know that's what it really is just because somebody's telling you? Well, you've learned that's what it should be. And that's one of the pitfalls of fieldwork be very, very careful about not interpreting, even in a subtle way, you know, you're thinking that your, your biases are on the, in the open, making a mistake that they're not. And we even got to a point, I think it was because of Marxism, that everyone started, instead of trying to eliminate your biases, you state them. What the heck's the point of that? You state your biases, then you go ahead and study in terms of them. I mean, is that what that's about? You don't. You, you become a Zen monk and you eliminate your thoughts and prejudices right out of your mind. And then you try and see what it is you're looking at for what it really is as best you can. It may not be perfect, but it's better than saying, well, I think this is exchange. So that's what I'm going to record. But of course, it's not. Well, I did the same thing. I did the same thing. It took them to teach me how to see properly and what that meant, right? So here we go, you know, we're in 2016. I haven't been back since 2001, but I'm in contact with the people. <clears throat> when Slim came along, everything changed in 2002. I'm raising a kid. And I can't just travel off and go here and there and everywhere. I've become a full-time dad. Well, sharing it, but full-time in the sense that's what I do. And I made a conscious decision. I would stay on my own and raise my kid. And it just happened he turned out to be a ball player, a really good ball player. And that's what I always wanted to be. <laughs> Not that pushing him to be it, because he wants it anyway, but it's really neat to be able to essentially go back to something outside academia and all the pressures of everything else that went with it to something that you really loved as a kid. You know what I mean? And I played up until three years ago. I played pretty serious senior ball at 70, 71, 72. 
but now I can't. Like Achilles tendon is gone. My kid took uh, took out my shoulder. He's taken out my wrist. I can't catch him anymore. He just hits me when I put my glove up. The ball doesn't go where it's supposed to for me. <laughs> but that's what that's what I decided. And then maybe it's too extreme. Maybe I should have maybe gone back. I'm not sure. Maybe I will. It costs a lot of money, for one thing. It's, it's not cheap. I don't know. Maybe this will stimulate something, doing this. Because I haven't thought about this in a long time. I haven't even discussed it with anybody for years since I quit teaching. My teaching was good because I could teach some of this stuff. And kids really, because it was different, I really liked it. I liked it because it was different. It was a different way of thinking. Eh? But now, you know, if the Aborigines don't even think like this themselves for the most part, now they're becoming part of us. Not that they want to, it's just happening. So, anyway. Yeah, that's just the Aboriginal part of everything. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. In between when Ian died and then kind of getting back together, a whole lot of things happened. I went to India, trekked across Himachal Pradesh in the Himalayas, almost died in a, in a blizzard, hung out with good German Muslim nomads for the next two summers in the, in the mountains, living like a good jar. And herding sheep or goats, I guess, cattle, stuff like that. Yeah, visiting Buddhist temples, Hindu temples, trying to get some meaning to all of it. Kind of a, you know, just a quest, see where all the commonalities were. Yeah. 